Thank you. Um, are my slides on here? Dr. Miles, um, I will pull them up real, just give me one second, okay? Okay. While we're getting those up, I just like to kind of tell you how I got here. Uh, I moved from born and raised in Louisville, Kentucky, and moved to Russell County in 1980 and, and was the solo family physician for almost um, uh, 35 years. Um, I was here originally when cocaine was big. I saw methamphetamine uh, get big, and then the opioid epidemic came, and I saw how it pretty much uh, affected uh, our community. And uh, I, I've gotten involved in dealing with that. I became a medical review officer, subsequently began giving lectures on, uh, subsequently began giving lectures on uh, uh, how, to, how to look at a urine drug screen. Uh, then I was asked uh, after those lectures by the Kentucky Academy of Family Physicians to give lectures on uh, the use and prescription of opioid. At one point in time, one of my proud points was Russell County was in 2013 was the least number of prescriptions for opioids uh, for um, um, the state of Kentucky per 100,000. So um, we, we've, we've worked on that. Uh, subsequently, um, I began giving lectures on the expert for the uh, Kentucky Academy of Family Physicians. And um, as, as that's gone, uh, I've gotten into the Lake Cumberland Community Action and as their consultant. So that's how I got here. Um, I've got a two and a half hour lecture that is on uh, the Kentucky Academy of Family Physicians.org on ESPERT. It's a, a lot deeper than this. I understand I got about 45 minutes to an hour to get through this and, and I will go through fairly quickly. Uh, my lecture was oriented more toward physicians, but I think everybody on this call can take this. And so far I've really enjoyed, uh, enjoyed the, uh, the lectures that we've got. So. Um, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment uh, is what we're talking about. Um, see if I can advance this. Okay. Our learning objective, uh, define expert, well, why is expert important? Substance use disorder is a medical disease from a public health perspective. Uh, performing uh, screening in practice, performing brief intervention in practice, and then planning and implementing referral for treatment. Uh, I understand our next uh, slide will show that we've got uh, a various group here, but uh, I'm gonna ask you all to do something here. Well, on the next couple of slides, we'll show you the ACE questionnaire. Hopefully everybody uh, uh, is um, aware of adverse childhood experiences. But um, as you go through, I want you to do this test yourself to uh, get, get the score yourself. So um, while you were growing up, your first 18 years of life, and I'm sure a lot of you all are familiar with this, but did a parent or adult in the household swear at you, insult, put you down, humiliate, act in a way that you made, made you afraid you might be hurt physically? Did a parent or adult in the household push, slap, grab, or throw something at you, ever hit you so hard you had marks or were injured? Did an adult or a person at least five years or older ever touch or fondle you, touch you in a sexual way, actually try to have uh, oral, anal, vaginal sex with you? You often feel that no one in your family loved you uh, uh, or thought you were important or special. Your family didn't look out for each other or support each other. Did you often feel that you didn't have enough to eat, had to wear dirty clothes, had no one to protect you, or your parents were too drunk or too high to take care of you uh, or take you to the doctor if needed? Uh, one for most of our kids these days, were your parents ever separated or divorced? Uh, was your mother or stepmother pushed, grabbed, slapped, or had something thrown at her, or sometimes or often kicked, bitten, hit with a fist, hit with something, ever repeatedly hit over at least a few minutes, threatened with a gun or knife, and not just your mother, stepmother. We don't talk about that much, but as, as a family physician, I've seen men that have been in, in uh, the situation where they were abused as well, and they're much less likely to talk about that, but some of us have seen those in the house, that in the household. Uh, did you live with anyone who was a problem drinker, alcoholic, or used street drugs? Was a household member depressed or mentally ill or did a household member attempt suicide and did a, a household member go to prison? So those are the questions. 
you can check your own score. Um, I, I'd say most of us here have at least one or two answers, and some of us have more than that. Our next slide. So why should I spend time getting this? There, there's two realities in every provider's uh, life. The first one is that um, at time is our most uh, valuable commodity. Um, the second one is that the substance uh, use disorder is one of the most destructive disorders we have. And, and we're, we're all tired of having to do extra training and do mandatory training. Uh, but sometimes the most difficult patients to deal with are those with substance use disorder. Um, you know, a lot of times they take a long time during an office visit for a physician. And just as you're uh, dealing with their hypertension, their ear infection, you start to walk out the door, uh, all of a sudden uh, they start talking to you about that. And it's a 40 minute visit, which you allotted 10 or 15 minutes for. But in today's environment, if you just hand them a prescription, don't talk to them about it, that's gonna cost you a lot, lot more uh, in terms of uh, facing the, the uh, licensure board or uh, malpractice, et cetera. So, you know, you really do need to learn how to deal with this. And, and SBIRT is screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. Hopefully you're gonna learn how to evaluate to find a substance use disorder. You learn that it's a chronic disease with a good adherence rate to treatment, it's the same as diabetes, hypertension, or asthma, and you're going to learn appropriate interviewing techniques. So um, how to maybe convert that 45 minute visit to a 15 to 20 minute visit. Our next slide. So I'm not going to get into this too much. Most of y'all already know the definition substance use disorder uh, basically causes clinical or functional significant uh, impairment. Uh, secondly, uh, it's, you know, we use that term because we want to reduce stigma and uh, we can see substance use disorder as a chronic illness rather than seeing a person as a drug addict. And I, I, one of the other things I've worked on is um, for Lake Cumberland uh, uh, District Health Department, uh, I was the one that, that gave the, the uh, you know, um, syringe exchange program lectures. And we've actually got six out of 10 of our counties that have had that. But I actually... Had a, had a person look at me and say, oh, why should we do this? They're just a bunch of drug addicts. Uh, I looked around, smiled at him and said, thank you. Uh, you just got me the vote. He didn't know what I was talking about, but one of the people on the panel with him uh, had had his son in rehab three times. One of them had been my patients 20 years before. We got him off of uh, his uh, substance and, and he'd straightened up. The other one's nephew was my patient. So I knew they were going to vote for me. Uh, so I, we got that, but that's still people's... Uh, people's attitude. So we have to work on that. Uh, we have to make people and the general public understand what substance use disorder is. But with substance use disorders, there's a 40 to 60% adherence to medical treatment. For diabetes, it's 60%. For hypertension, asthma, there's a 40% adherence. So it's similar treatment to other chronic diseases. So the treatment of uh, substance use disorder is not hopeless. It's a major disease costing our society $600 billion a year, resulting in over 100,000 deaths annually with the opioids. And uh, we talk about substance abuse, 140,000 a year with uh, a tobacco. Organized and quality treatment is required by all providers and we can help you get organized and save you time. So let's, let's move on with this a little bit. Next slide. So awareness of the problem, why is SBIRT uh, relevant? Everybody assumes that someone else will talk to or intervene or treat, I often assume the medical profession is resonant, it, but you look at the statistics, 94% of physicians fail to diagnose early substance abuse in adults. Um, a small percentage consider themselves very prepared to diagnose alcoholism, we're talking about 20%, illegal drug use, 17%, or prescription drug abuse, 30%. Individuals report not knowing what to do uh, once they do a po get a positive screen. So what do I do? So this is, this is where we go with the expert. Next. Uh, again, you all, you all seen these slides before. A lot of this we, we've taken from the SAM show, but what figment of the imagination has the power to isolate individuals and families, uh, encourage people to deny fatal illness, ignore symptoms, uh, keep desperately ill people from seeking help, block funding for treatment, persuade society to choose expensive alternatives like uh, imprisonment, the human and financial cost of accidents, second Ill Ill illness, and the wholesale loss of human lives, productivity, and potential. And that is obvious stigma. And there's the public stigma, the misperception, what I've already referred to, the imaginary stain on somebody else that I don't have, so I'm superior, uh, versus the self-stigma, which is actually more difficult. The, the person believes they're other, uh, they're inadequate, uh, 
leads to isolation. They lack engagement and treatment. They go further into addiction. So stigma towards addiction is one of the top barriers for accessing treatment and hundreds of thousands of people who need treatment aren't getting it uh, because of stigma. Next. So briefly, substance use disease has a, a social stigma. In March of 2018, there was a study and 53% of those interviewed felt that it was a disease, but 44% felt it was a lack of willpower. Uh, one third said it was a character defect and 39% and thought it was caused by mental illness or brain disorders. And in a sense, we're gonna talk about that in a second, there is some brain disorder with this. Stigma continues among Americans. More than 70% said that they wouldn't want somebody to marry into their family. 58% said that we need to do something about it. And if you really look at it, 70% uh, said we need, uh, that, that they don't wanna be involved with people in addiction. Although 58% said something needs to be done. So if that's us as providers, as physicians, as psychologists, uh, we're never gonna treat these people and never gonna treat this as a chronic disease. So we need to deal with that. Next. So experts defined as a comprehensive integrated public health approach focused on the delivery of early intervention and treatment services. First of all, we have universal screening for quickly assessing use and severity of alcohol, illicit drugs, prescription drug use, misuse, and abuse. Um, we do the screen, it's either low risk. If it's low risk, we affirm the positive choices and maybe check back later. If it's moderate to high risk, we need to do a brief intervention and possibly a referral to treatment. Uh, brief intervention uh, and awareness raising interventions given to risky or problematic substance uh, users and the referral to treatment, especially specialty care for patients with substance use disorder. Treatment may consist of just a brief treatment or they may require alcohol and uh, drug treatment. So next. So expert, we screen everyone. Uh, moderate to higher levels, as we've already pointed out, are at risk for developing substance use. Uh, we wanna do a universal screen. The primary goal of expert is to identify and uh, effectively intervene with those who are at moderate or high risk for psychological or healthcare problems related to their substance use. So it's effective. It reduces healthcare costs, severity of drug and alcohol use, risk of trauma, percentage of at-risk patients who go without specialized substance uh, use treatment. People who receive uh, screening in the ERs, hospitals, or primary care, we reduce ER visits by 20% just with the screening. Non-fatal injuries, 33%, 37% hospitalizations, 46% of arrests, and 50% of motor vehicle crashes. Uh, when people say, well, I don't know what to do with a screen or the people are gonna get mad at me if I do it, if I ask them, they're gonna be insulted. Actually, um, most of the studies show that most of the people that are in substance use disorder want their provider to talk to them. They want uh, their counselor to talk to them. They want to discuss this with them. They know they've got a problem. They know they're in trouble uh, and they don't know how to get out of it. And they're actually waiting for us to do that. So they don't really get angry. And there's ways to phrase this and we'll bring that up a little bit later. Uh, how you can do that so people don't get insulted. Next. So the process, again, four to 15 minute brief interview utilizing World Health Organization validated screens. There's a 20% change in behavior just from the brief interaction. So we do the screen again, low risk. We, we, we tell them, and we've actually got the numbers. If you do the audit, which is the alcohol, the DAS, which is the drugs, the craft for teenagers, your PDQ9, your anxiety skills, you're going to get a number that will actually help you take a look at it, moderate use, high use. And then if it's moderate, we do a brief negotiated interview, try to reduce the risk. Uh, we may try to refer to treatment if that's necessary. If it's high risk, we try to motivate them into treatment that may require detox, that may require, require substance uh, abuse treatment. And it's individual for each person, but this is uh, a way to go through your own head and you've actually got the numbers right in front of you. So our next slide, you know, substance use disorder, has a significant genetic um, background to it. Uh, whether it's alcohol, uh, tobacco, uh, opioids, uh, there, is a, there is a population there that is prone to, to substance abuse. And uh, a classic example, I had a young man that actually had done a lot of yard work for me, was a hard worker, married with two kids, had had a problem in the past and had done excellent. Um, he had to have dental work, went to his dentist, forgot to tell the dentist, that he had substance use disorder. The dentist gave him some oxycodone uh, for his pain relief. Uh, and the next thing you know, uh, he was in jail for uh, abusing his wife 
uh, and he, he was not working. Uh, we got him through all of that and he's actually back together with his wife and family. He's back working, but he was one prescription away from getting back into his substance use. And that's genetic. It's, it's there. I've seen alcoholics who were one uh, drink away from getting back into it. I had one fellow that we, we sobered up for five years. He was, became a preacher, a fishing buddy came by, gave him a beer. He came in three months later. We had to sober him up and detox him again. He stayed clear for three years and then got back into it again with the fishing buddies that came by again, according to the family. And we never did get him cleared. He ended up dying of cirrhosis. So, um, and what we know next, push the next slide there is that 50% of uh, the risk of addiction is genetic. Uh, this is the next couple of slides are slides that actually convinced me. Cause I'm going to be honest with you seven or eight years ago, I would have been one of the physicians that said, you know, uh, I got them detoxed. They ought to be able to say no. They ought to be able to get away from this. They ought to do that. And, and when you look at this, the dopamine levels in the brain, uh, an orgasm is the most pleasurable, natural thing in, in, to the human being. But if you take a look at here, your first um, drug high can be twice that of an orgasm. And once you get dependent, they use the term addicted here. Once you get dependent or have the substance use disorder, you get them down in this morass and you can't even get back to baseline. And I tell people, uh, most people who are in substance use disorder are just trying to get back to baseline. They're, after a while, they're not trying to get high. They're just trying to take enough to where they can function and get through the day. And then if you take a look at this next slide, this one really sold me, to be honest with you. Um, the top is the normal brain and the yellow and the red, that's your dopamine receptors, your dopamine two receptors. And these get burned up and used up uh, with substance use disorder. Once uh, you go off of that, the second slide is 10 days of abstinence. And this happens to be from cocaine, but it's the same for whether it's alcohol, uh, opioids, uh, whatever. But you take a look and the brain's blue. It's not lit up anymore. They, they've used up all of their dopamine receptors and the brain's not glowing and functioning like it should. And the frontal part of the brain, this part of the brain up here is the one that makes the decision. Do I get up and go to work today? Do I buy clothes for my kid or spend the money on alcohol? Um, you know, do I, do I go out and, and get high or, or do I take care of my kids? That doesn't start lighting up. You look at even a hundred days, that is not fully lit up. And a classic example of this, I had a young man, great young man, um, athlete, leader in school, but he got in college and got into drugs. And next thing you know, he was shooting heroin and he had a choice of five years in prison or a year in rehab. We lucked out and found a rehab unit for him to get into. He got into that. And when he got out, he came back and he told me, he said, he said, I spent the first three to four months blowing smoke up their rear ends. He said, I told him what they wanted to hear. He said, uh, um, it was about three to four months. I started getting with the program by nine months. I was working with other people. And fortunately, a young man finished his year, uh, got out, went to uh, engineering school and is now working as an engineer, well-employed. Uh, he's been sober for seven or eight years now. Uh, but uh, he, he just emphasized this to me. You know, it was 120 days before he really started getting with the program. And a lot of people, it takes two to 300 days. So I can't just withdraw you and four or five days later tell you, okay, you're clean. Let's get over that. It is a disease of the brain and it takes a long time to heal. And that's why so many people spend so much money on two day uh, rehab programs or, or two week rehab programs and they, they go back right, right back out and fail. So next. So again, we looked at the adverse abuse, neglect, household dysfunction. It's very common. 28% of the study uh, participants reported physical abuse, 21% sexual abuse. Uh, multiple experience, about 40% of the Kaiser sample reported two or more, 12.5% uh, experience four or more. It's dose response. So a cumulative uh, ACE score has a strong relationship to health, social, and behavioral problems. So our next slide shows the behavioral problems, lack of activity, smoking, alcoholism, drug use, miswork. I know a lot of you all are already aware of this, but if there's anybody out there, I just want to make sure how important this is. Ace of four plus, they're 12 times more likely to commit suicide. Six plus, they have a 20 year less life expectancy. Those behavior leads to these physical problems. So we're not just talking about substance use disorder. We're talking about severe obesity, diabetes, depression, uh, suicide attempts, sexually transmitted diseases, heart disease, cancer, stroke, COPD, broken bones. Next. And if you look 
Have you ever had a drug problem, ever been addicted to drugs, ever injected drugs? As your ACE score goes up, it's an exponential rise. Not much difference between three and four uh, in these two, but still it's, it's going up. The higher your ACE score is, the more likely you are to have substance use disorder, okay? So the other thing that happens, early adversity synthesizes the threat vigilance response system. So these affect different parts of the brain, not just the cortical amygdala, but also other portions of the brain as well. And it actually grows and gets larger. And even in adulthood, people have had childhood stresses have, have that, that abnormal cortical amygdala. The, the amygdala is altered by the childhood stresses and those with ACE scores higher than three are prone to addiction because the opioid drugs commandeer an endogenous system that's integral and vital to the body's responses to stressful and painful stimuli. In other words, the brain has been altered. The brain is different in someone who went through these ACEs and they are more prone to uh, uh, addiction, substance use disorder. Next. So again, we can take a look. Um, this is a community thing. If you look at the ACEs, that I, when I first looked at those, it made common sense to me. You know, it's genetic, it's familial, it goes through the family, uh, it leads to poverty. Uh, people get into situations where they're not just the poverty, but, but uh, you know, their entire society, their housing, their, their community, everything is affected by this. And working in Appalachia, we are the 70th poorest county in Kentucky. And at one point in time, the 70th poorest county in the United States. And as a primary care provider, uh, I can tell you, I know how much economics affect what you can do to help a person, what you can do to help them. And I also know how much people are just looking for a way out of this life. As somebody said earlier, uh, they, they don't want to recall that their child was taken away. So, uh, you know, they, they stay high. And, and that's a big part of it. So the community and the individuals are all affected by these ACEs. Next. So we've kind of been through, it is a disease. It is a disease of the brain. It is not a character disorder. You're not a bad person. And I've gone and talked to some of our local groups and get, give them those slides just so they understand, you know, this is, this is something that your brain's going through. We need to correct that when it's gonna take time, but you're not a bad human being. You're not a bad person. So when we talk about screening brief intervention, I like this cartoon. It's something new, we call it intervention. We're not gonna just be beating you over the head. That's not what we're talking about. So the S in Siebert is for screening. And we'll go to the next one. The screening is a pre-screen. It's a very brief uh, group of questions. Don't, doesn't take 30 minutes to do. And then if that screen's positive on anything, you move to the specific screen for that. So the audit is for alcohol, DAST is for drugs, CRAFT is for your adolescence. You got your PDQs. And then you get the scores like we talked about. And so you can, you can go on and, and deal with that. Next. So step one, the pre-screen in the past year, have you had three or more drinks uh, containing alcohol on any one day? Uh, have you used a prescription medication more than prescribed or not prescribed? And even more comprehensively, are you taking anything? If so, what, for how long were they prescribed for you? You take them as directed. And a lot of people don't understand that. As a physician, if I write for a narcotic TID PRM, which means three times a day as needed, and the patients come back for follow-up, um, and they said, well, I'm taking it three times. No, no, you're only supposed to be taking it if you actually have, have to have that. And in practice, I made a point not to, not to give anybody more than two weeks and I had them come back. And even at the height of all this, I was actually at a conference and one of the hot shots from Boston that was under Big Pharma's uh, group came in and gave us a lecture on what terrible doctors we were because we weren't prescribing enough pain medication and only 1% of people would get addicted. And she actually put up a, a slide that showed Russell County was gray surrounded by red counties and the red counties are the ones that prescribe the most narcotics. And she said, this, this county doesn't know how to treat pain. I raised my hand and said, excuse me. Um, we try to limit narcotics for two weeks. We try to make a diagnosis, treat the calls. We use physical therapy and massage therapy and NSAIDs. She looked at me and said, there's a space, special place in hell for doctors that don't treat pain. So that's what we were going through. But I, I still saw even though I wasn't doing it, a lot of the specialists you know, would give somebody three months worth of narcotic and then not see them back for three months. And so um, the, the patients, the doctor would say, well, I told them as needed. Well, you have to make that clear and discuss that. So that's something we discuss when we go through the screen with the patients once it's positive. Also, if you use drugs other than required for medical reasons, in the past year, if you used tobacco, and again, I said 140,000 people die of tobacco overdose versus 100,000 for the opioids. In the past year, been depressed, have you been anxious? Have you ever thought about harming yourself? So that's the pre-screen. 
Uh, that can be done fairly quickly. Next slide. That can be done fairly quickly uh, on an intake uh, into the office or uh, on an intake into your, your uh, practice uh, and an ER or whatever. And it gives you a, a pretty good idea that we can move on to the uh, audits and DAS and the crafts of the World Health Organization things based on that. So go on, move on to the next one. The key points for screening, you wanna screen everyone. Now, if you're already treating someone that you know is in quote active addiction is the term they used here, rather uh, assess or uh, overall use to make uh, referral or uh, intervention decisions, you don't really need to rescreen them. You already know they got a problem, but almost everyone that's not been screened needs to be screened. Pre-screening again can be with another health or wellness survey, home health care intake, outpatient intake screens, ER intakes, uh, whatever you're doing, uh, that pre-screen can be done. And you want to screen both for drugs and alcohol, including prescription uh, drug abuse and tobacco. So remember, people may not think that they're taking the drug incorrectly, as I talked about TID, PRN versus, versus taking it three times a day on a regular basis. They may be crushing. Some, some medications are made to be uh, delivered over a long term and not immediately. But if they're crushed, they get to the quick high and then they go down. And all of a sudden, you've got a medication that you've prescribed that uh, should have lasted eight hours. It's lasting two or three hours. And they're having to take it more often. And then they get into the dependency. And sharing is common in Appalachian culture. You know, they mean well. They want to share with each other. Uh, you go to grandma's house and, and, and she's got severe arthritis and her doctor gave her some, some uh, codeine for that pain and she doesn't take them very often, but you got a headache and, and uh, they, they're going to give that to you to help you with your headache. And then the next thing you know, if you're uh, prone uh, genetically, uh, you've already got a problem. And, and again, I've seen patients that were one or two pills away, not most people. Uh, sometimes it just takes the prescribing over a longer period of time, but there are patients that are there. So explore each substance. Many patients use more than one. Then use your validated tool, like we said, uh, general anxiety disorder, the PHQ-9 for depression, the crafts, the audits, and follow up on your positives. You got red flags, uh, uh, assessing details and consequences of use. You need to follow up on that. And that's where you use your motivational interviewing skills. They're non-judgmental and empathetic, verbal and nonverbal. And, and you know, I can, I can tell you 90% of what we say is, or what we interact with each other is nonverbal and all the counselors out there know that but if somebody comes into me and they want they're talking to me about their alcohol use or their their opioid use and i cross my arms and cross my legs and i'm i take a look at them out of the side of my eyes they know they're being judged i don't have to tell them they're being judged so you have to be very aware of your own body language and your own feelings you've got to get in touch with this before you ever start talking to people you know you have to be more open and honest with them and I've heard doctors say, well, I don't talk about my personal life um, with my patients and, and uh, they, they don't need to know that that's not part of it. Well, I think sometimes part of the empathy is letting patients know you've been there, you've done that, you've seen them, um, um, you've been through some of these things. And uh, for my patients, when I talk to them about my own personal situations, uh, I had an A score of four growing up and I grew up in Lively Shively, which is now known as Shoot 'em Up Shively. Uh, they understand I've been there. I've, I've been through some of the things they've been through. I don't have to tell them everything that went on in my life, just like I didn't ask you to tell us, you know, if somebody has an ACE score for it, I'm not going to ask them to tell me specifically which ones were unless they want to talk about it. But, but at least let them know that you're empathetic, that you care, and, and you're open, and you're not judging them. Next point. So we're going to go through this briefly, but there, there's your screens. There's the information. One thing I will say, there's not a there's not a World Health Organization screen for tobacco, but you can provide quit line information uh, in our community. We've actually uh, gone together with the hospital and the uh, health department. We've been on KET. We have a very successful uh, tobacco uh, uh, cessation classes. And after two weeks, we've actually paid for the uh, uh, medications uh, uh, for the uh, cessation, uh, for the patches, uh, for the Chantix, whatever we're going to use. Uh, so we cover that and, and we've, we've done very well with that. Next. So quickly, again, I'm not going to go through every one of these questions, but you can look at uh, how often do you ha have a drink containing alcohol? If it's two to three times a week, the score is four. And you go through each of these questions and you add up the total score at the bottom. And then you've got the score that, that we were showing you earlier. Now, we'll say the pre-screen is three drinks. For men, it's five. For women and men over 65, uh, it's four. Uh, so uh, those, again, uh, you know, you add up that score and you've got your score and that helps you decide whether it's mild, moderate or, or severe. So next. 
And then when you got the audit score, it's very helpful. Uh, you take a look at these scores and, and at risk hazardous use, but, but not as severe as zone uh, three is moderate uh, to severe risk and then severe risk. So that changes on what you're gonna do, how you're gonna treat them, whether you're gonna do just a brief intervention or you wanna monitor, try to do outpatient treatment, whether they need, uh, need referral at that point in time. Uh, if you need to refer or unless you're going to be treating them yourself. So next. Uh, and again, the DAS is pretty much just a yes or no. That's why the scores are different. But again, uh, have you used drugs other than those required for medical reasons? Yes or no. You know, do you abuse more than one drug at a time, et cetera? And you go down through here and you've got a score uh, and it's 10 questions. So again, your score is different from your audit, but, but again, it, it still asks the basic questions. So next. We look at the pyramid here and, you know, as we go through that, you can take a look. And, and when I talk to physicians about the expert, I say, you know, you got to realize I don't want to do this screen. I'll find too many people. Well, 75% of your patients are really not going to be a major, major risk. And just briefly talking with them, well, let, let's see what we can do and, and maybe try to drink, uh, you know, less. And I'll talk to you in, a, in six weeks and we'll, we'll discuss that. 20% uh, are going to be, well, you know, we need to talk about uh, some reduction. Uh, for example, tobacco, you're smoking two packs a day. Uh, let's do one less cigarette a day. I'll, I'll see you back uh, in a month and, and we'll see if you're down to half of that and then we'll try to wean you off of that. And then the high severity, uh, again, may need more counseling, may need referral to a counselor, may need MAT treatment, um, may need uh, um, treatment for the depression or whatever and, and more counseling. So. Uh, you've got these numbers, they help, they do that. But uh, a study uh, from Oklahoma that they did where physicians had a 2000 patient panel um, and they did universal screening and provided the mat themselves, they found that most of the, the primary care doctors were only treating five to 10 patients out of their practice with, with the mat. Uh, a lot of it was alcohol and, and they were referring and dealing with that, uh, but not as many as they would suspect. So, you know, uh, people are afraid to do screening uh, because they're afraid they'll have too many positive answers, but it's it's something we can handle. And I, th I think it's better if you know what's going on rather than get a call from the emergency room, find out your patient's overdosed or, or your, your call from the wife saying that he's had a problem for years and he's getting ready to lose his job. So next. So again, the craft is for the teenagers. You ask the first three questions. Uh, if they're positive, then you, any of them are positive, you go on for the rest of them. If they're negative, then you ask the fourth question. Uh, but again, a score of just two, uh, then we need some intervention. So next. Um, so in summary, if you take a look, you can ask those, you've got a score and it helps when I walk into the room, if I'm going in to see somebody for uh, hypertension or for an ear infection, but I walk into the room and they've already done these screens and I've got in front of me that what their score is and I know whether I'm gonna to need to make that more advanced, then I can plan that in advance. And, and we kind of do what we've got to do, uh, do a brief intervention with them, and then maybe talk to them about following back up fairly soon and, and discussing that with them. And we'll talk about how you get around to doing that. So next. So again, evaluation, uh, expert training, brief intervention, referral treatment. So pre-screen, and you, know, you can do this as an EMT, you can do this as a nurse, you can do this as a counselor. Uh, it doesn't take much to do that on your, on your initial intake. Um, Pre-screen's positive, then the, the more extensive validated scores. And, and you, know, you could even, as you bring them in the emergency room, say, well, we did a pre-screen, this is a problem, uh, you know, or, or we got a drug overdose. You, you, you know that you don't have to pre-screen. You, you know you've already got a problem. And, and so uh, maybe they can do a further screen there. Then we want to get into motiva motivational interviewing skills, brief negotiated interview and referral treatment, and then uh, referral to treatment and risk reduction. Next. So after screening, what do we do? Brief intervention, utilizing motivational interview techniques. Um, and again, here's the same um, thing that we have, but when we get into the next uh, training that I'm gonna do is on motivational interviewing skills. This one's not as extensive as what you'll get on that two and a half hour lecture if you wanna get onto that, uh, because I had to kind of compress this, but we will discuss that quickly. So. Uh, so main thing here is motivate them into treatment and reduce the risk for the moderate use. So I'm going to spend a little bit more time on this. The framework of motivational interviewing, the spirit, the principles, the micro skills, change, talk, and commitment. And I'm sure 
most of the psychologists and, and psychiatrists here are very aware of this and a lot of the MSWs. Uh, for the rest of us, it might not be something we're that aware of. But the spirit is autonomy, collaboration, and evocation. So, uh, you know, we want to we want the patient to know I'm not an authoritarian physician who's going to tell you what you do. And I've had friends, well, if they don't do what I do, I'm going to throw them out of my practice. Well, you're an idiot because uh, you're there to help them. But the autonomy, they need to understand that this is up to them, um, that they have the right to say what's going on in their treatment. They have the right to affect that. They have the right to talk to me about it if they don't disagree with me. Um, so they have to develop that autonomy. You're not going to help them. We used to say, until somebody wants to be helped, you're not going to help them. And uh, you may want to offer that to them. They may want to be helped. They may not have asked you. Collaboration, let them know we're in this together. And I used to tell patients, doctor means teacher. My job is to tell you about the problem. Uh, I'm going to be here to help you, but I can't make the changes. I'm not the one that's going to change your life. You've got to be that one. And evocation, you got to evoke in them a feeling that they, they want to change this. They, they want to do something different. Um, so that's the spirit. The principles, you want to roll with resistance. Uh, you, know, um, um, you can't get upset. You can't get angry. Um, I once had a young man as an MRO that I called and told me he had a positive uh, marijuana screen. And he said, you know, you're a Nazi. You don't know anything about marijuana. Uh, I basically told him I went to college from 1969 to 73. I knew a lot about marijuana. Um, and uh, that, that um, I, he had signed a contract with his company and, and, and that's what I was calling him about. Uh, I, I couldn't take it personal. I couldn't get angry uh, with him. Uh, and that probably was more than I should have done to be honest with you. But uh, for a lot of my patients, when they resisted, I had to learn to back off. You wanna express empathy. And if you're a provider, I don't care if you're an EMT, a paramedic, a nurse, a doctor, um, a social worker, uh, a psychologist, if you're not empathetic, you don't need to be in that field. You know, we're here to care for people, to help them. Sometimes they don't make the right choices. Uh, and sometimes you don't know their story to deal with that. And, and as a physician, I used to go back in the morning after I treated an overdose uh, and, and I would sit down at the bedside and just talk with them. Just let them know that I saw them as a human being, not as an overdose. And, uh, that I was concerned about them and, and I wanted to get them the help. And if they weren't my patient, that I'd like to send a copy of their discharge to their doctor and, and let them know what they went through. And I wanted them to talk to them about that. But you have to show that empathy. You have to develop discrepancy. You know, a lot of people don't understand that they've got a problem. You know, oh, well, I go to the VFW every night and we drink six beers, but all my buddies drink six beers. Yeah, but most people don't drink six beers a night. Or, you know, well, all my friends smoke marijuana. Well, you know, only about 30% of adolescents actually uh, have smoked and only about 16% use it on a regular basis. So there's some discrepancy that's not normal and they may not realize that. And then you want to support self-efficacy. You want them to realize they can do something about this. The micro skills are open-ended questions. And one, one of the you know, things is, you know, why are you addicted to drugs? You know, why, you know, you don't do that. You, you, you say, tell me about, tell me about uh, the medications that you're taking. Tell me, tell me about uh, what's good about it. What's bad about it. Discuss that with me. Um, you know, and you affirm when, when they talk to you about it, you have to affirm, okay, I understand this is what you're talking about. Why do you think we're there? And, and then reflect, okay, what I hear you saying is this, this, and this, and, and maybe my point of view on that's something a little bit different. Um, and then summarize, well, we've talked about this and here's what you said. Uh, here's what I, I heard you say, and let me know if that's not right. And then, then my reflection on that. And so, uh, those are the micro skills we have to do. And then you want to get change talk, desires, ability, reason, and need. So what are their desires? What do, what do they want out of this interaction? What are their abilities? Well, I just can't get off of it. Well, that's not true. I, I think you can. You just need some help. And we need to get through that. Uh, you are capable of doing this. And I know it doesn't feel like it right now, but there's reasons for that. And sometimes I go through the, the brain things that are going on. Uh, the reason that they need to quit. Well, you know, I've had a lot of patients come in and as I call it the door handles, I'm walking out, I'm done seeing them for the hypertension. Well, doc, my wife's leaving me. Okay, why? And we get into that and, and they, they tell me about their drug uh, usage or their alcohol usage and their reason for wanting to quit, uh, their need to quit. You know, gosh, doc, I'm going to lose my job. I won't have any money. I won't be able to support my family. Uh, and, and so you need to do that change talk. And then we need commitment, you know, intention and decision. You, you want them to decide that they're going to try to do that. I had to, to, I'm using tobacco because it's a little bit easier to deal with uh, as far as talk quickly, but had a patient came in and uh, um, 
you know, he told me, Doc, I know you're hell on tobacco. I don't want, want you to talk to me about it. Uh, I, I grow tobacco and that's how I make my living. And I said, well, you know, this is what I do for a living and it's my job. And if you don't want me to do my job completely, then I'll, I won't do that. But, but you know, uh, you really do need. And then I've had some say, well, okay, I, I, I guess I do need to quit. So how do I go about that? And then the activation, we get them ready and prepared. Well, I'm going to refer you. Here, here's a number. I want you to call that number because um, I think that, that you need to be referred uh, to our smoking cessation class. And so taking steps, I'm not calling that number for them. I'm letting them call that number and take that step, you know, but let them know. And the next time they come in, did you call that number? Well, no. Well, well you know, are, are, are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you thinking about it? Where, where are we? So that's what leads to behavior change. And, and that's what we need to do. So next. So, okay, we've done the post-screening and it's time to do something. So we got the brief negotiated interview. We want to motivate them into treatment uh, or we want to deal with that, you know, reduce the risk. And again, like we talked about, if, if somebody comes in and they tell me they're drinking six drinks a day, every day, you know, and we talk about why, what went on, what the problem is, in the negotiated interview, I can kind of say, let's see what we can do about that. Uh, you know, um, I think, you know, you're just at moderate risk at this point, looking at your scales. So why don't we try backing off? Let me, let me maybe see you in, in a week and we'll talk or two weeks and we'll talk about that. And then if they need more treatment, uh, you know, maybe, maybe they need, uh, you know, the injectable Vivitrol, maybe they need uh, AA, maybe they need something. We can talk to them about referral treatment. On the high risk, we get in, we want to motivate them into treatment. It's not just discussion. We want to try to get them into treatment. And that treatment may require detox or substance abuse treatment. Uh, but we've got to find a way to motivate them and, and talk to them. And again, using our motivational interview techniques. Next. So again, the brief negotiated interview, referral to treatment, we apply those steps for motivational interviewing. And again, on the other talk, that's almost an hour long on motivational interviewing. But so how do we get to an evidence-based intervention to motivate the client to risk reducing behaviors of treatment? Next. So what is brief intervention? It's awareness raising intervention given to risky or problematic substance use. Um, there are several models, including the brief negotiated interview. It's a semi-structured interview process based on motivational interviewing techniques that is a proven evidence-based practice. And it can be done in five to 15 minutes. Uh, that doesn't mean that's your final, obviously. You can do five to 15 minutes and say, you need to come back. And I've spent as much as 45 minutes with patients. I, when I was going through my residency, one of, we had a clinical psychologist that, and he would talk with me. He said, you know, he told me, I mean, I was a first year resident. And he said, you're really good at this. You know, how did you get so good at talking to people? I said, I grew up in an environment where if you didn't know how to talk to people, you got your butt kicked. You had to know, you had to know how to negotiate with people. You had to know how to make them not angry. You had to talk with them. So it really, it was one of the life things that, that, that made me, made me realize that uh, I could actually do that and do that well. But, but five to 15 minutes, at least initially and bring them back. And then once you plan for a little bit longer period, that's good. Or once you refer them to a counselor, he can spend a longer time uh, with them. Next. So BNI is four steps. You've got to build rapport. you got to raise the subject. You got to explore the pros and cons, decisional balance from the motivational interview. You got to provide feedback. You got to build readiness to change and negotiate a plan. And this is four separate steps, but it's not always separate steps. It goes back and forth during that conversation. Next. So building rapport, you want to begin with a general conversation. As a, you know, as a doctor in a small town, I've, I've treated five generations of some families. Uh, and so how's your grandma? How's things going? I already know that there's a family history of alcohol or drug abuse or sexual abuse or whatever. When I'm talking to them, I already know their family history because I've dealt with them. It's a small town. You know, I, you hear about everybody and everything. Uh, um, so, uh, but I'm going to start a general conversation. Then you want to ask permission to talk to them about that. You, you want to kind of say, well, you know, we're here to see you for your blood pressure day. Let's deal with that. But I also, my screens, my pre-screen show that we may have a problem with alcohol or may have a problem with 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 the opioids so so let me let me talk to you about that if you would and what if they don't want to talk about it well again you got to build that relationship now as a family doctor that's a lot easier that's one of the reasons i'm pushing for matt in in, in primary care uh for nurse practitioners and family physicians because 
Um, we already know these patients. We already have a rapport. But if you're in the emergency room, it's the first time you you see that patient. Maybe the last time you'll ever see them. Or you know, if somebody comes to you for counseling, referred to you, and you've not seen them, you got to develop that rapport. Um, you want to normalize the conversation. If they're resistant, you don't want to keep saying no. But I want to talk. You go, okay. Well, let's deal with the blood pressures here, and then you can kind of say, you know. Uh, I really would like to talk with you about that. It's important, but if, maybe you go home and think about it. Maybe we can talk about it next time. Um, I once had a patient, I preached to her for 30 years and uh, I retired from pra patient practice, went in more administrative things about six years ago. And the last day of my practice, she made a point to make an appointment to see me. And she said, I have a gift for you. What's that? She said, you've talked to me for 30 years about this. She said, I quit smoking four months ago. Uh, one of the best gifts I got. Uh, six years later, she's still not smoking. I still check on her in our community. But uh, uh, but you can you can talk to him about that and, and say, I want to bring this back later on. Discuss the pros and cons. So help me understand through your eyes what's good about alcohol. You know, what's not so good about alcohol. One of the greatest questions I've learned from, from these courses, as a provider, I used to say, on a scale of one to 10, how ready are you to quit smoking or to quit drinking? Or quit? And they'd say two. I said, well, heck, it's not worth my time. I'm not going to waste my time talking to him about it. But what I learned was to say, okay, two. Uh, you didn't say zero, so why two? That's an open-ended question that allows them to say, well, my wife tells me I shouldn't be doing that. You know, there are things that you can you can do on that that, that actually help you uh, at least raise it with them. And what they may find out going through their own heads, and that's why I tell people, the best counselors are, are not people that tell them what to do or walk through their heads or, you know, tell them, you know, why do you hate your mother? The best counselors want to help them walk through their own minds and help them walk their own things. A lot of times when you ask that question, they're not really a two, they're a four or five. And they know they need the help. They know they need that problem, uh, but they haven't really faced it yet. So at least you get that conversation started. Next. So you want to provide feedback. Again, we said ask permission to give information. And you can give educational information. Well, you know, here's what my screen showed. And here's the numbers. And this is what it talks about. And this has been done all over the world. We know um, that that's uh, a, we're, at a, we're at a problem at this point in time. And I want to help you with that. Uh, and I'd like to give you that information why I believe that. And then denormalize their use. Once again, uh, not, not every teenager smokes marijuana. The majority don't. And they may not be aware of that. They may not be aware, like I said, that uh, everybody doesn't, doesn't uh, sit there and, and drink with their buddies uh, every night for, uh, you know, a six pack or a 12 pack, that that's not normal. Discuss your screening findings, as I said, link substance use behavior to any known consequences. And, and that's something I've had people come in and say, I'm getting divorced, I'm losing my job, uh, I'm going bankrupt. And, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I just can't seem to deal with people in public. And so we kind of get into how that relates to the substance use disorder. You know, uh, you want to evoke a response. If it's a positive reaction, then you move forward. If it's a negative reaction, you revisit the pros and cons. Don't become defensive. Don't say, I'm going to throw you out of my practice because you're not doing what I'm asking. Or, or you know, well, you, you can't talk to me like that. So, you know, I, I, I really just want to help you. And, and I understand that. So, you know, tell me again, why is it good? Why is it bad? Why do you not want to talk about it? You know, uh, and, and so the feedback helps. The next step, is build readiness to change. We, we talked about uh, the darn uh, getting ready for change. So you use the open-ended questions. You're encouraged, that encourages engagement. That they're not gonna be a yes or no answer. They're gonna talk to you. It opens doors for exploration. Again, it lets them walk through their own mind. You wanna reuse reflections and, and you know, it's, it's okay. They, they, they're talking and, and we can let a little silence sit there sometimes. Sometimes that's better than talking too much like some of us are guilty of doing. Uh, but reflective listening, say, well, I hear you saying this. This is what you're telling me. Is is that correct? Uh, and then sometimes thinking reflective. Well, you say this, you say it's not that, but but to me, maybe maybe it can be. That's what I'm hearing. And 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 why do you think I'm not, I'm not right there? And then summarizing your reinforcement what you said. You show careful listening. I listened to what you said. I cared about what you said. And you you don't know how many times I've had patients come back from referrals to specialists. They walked in. They looked at the X-rays. They never put a stethoscope on my chest. They told me what they wanted me to do and walked out and they never listened to a word I said about how my chest was feeling or how my shortness of air was or, or what I did. And that turns, that turns that person off. They want to know that you're listening to them. 
And just by letting them know, they, they know you've got some empathy. They know you got some compassion. They know that you care about what happens to them. And the biggest compliment I get as a family doc is, is you were always there for me. You cared for me when nobody else did. You listened to what I said. And even though you and I didn't always agree, you, you at least heard what I said. And that means so much to so many people because there's so many voices out there shouting at them anymore and on the internet telling them what they have to do and can't do that's bad information that uh, they, they want somebody to care and listen to them and they'll trust you. That develops the rapport. Next. And then you want to negotiate a plan. I love this cartoon. What if we don't change it all and something magical just happens? I, you know, you have to plan for something. You want to plan for a reduction of use to a lower level, like I've already referred to on several occasions. Uh, you want to plan for a referral and agreement to follow up with specialty treatment services. So you want to plan something. You want to get that along with the patient. Uh, you want to get the patient to understand that uh, um, you're there for them, you're there to help them, but we've got to make a change. We've got to do something different and lead them into that. So next. So referral to treatment. Uh, let's talk about how we do that. Next. It's well established that substance abuse treatment can be effective. The following are strategies that's going to be the greatest likelihood of successful treatment referral. Next. So we look at the continuum. We've got health promotions. Like I said, I've been very active in the syringe exchange. I don't like the term needle, but that's on there. Syringe exchange. Primary care. I've worked with the drug courts and given lectures there. Uh, we talked about the universal screening and referral. You got your community-based groups, 12-step programs, et cetera. You got your outpatient co-occurring treatment, your medication assistant treatment, daily, weekly, monthly, your psychiatric services, your individual family group services. Then, and I love residential services short-term, 28 days to 90 days, not two weeks, uh, but, but long-term is six to 12 months. You got the population specific, faith based, and then you got your hospitalization, your medication management, your detox your stabilization. So it's an entire continuum. And we as a society need to work on healthy communities and wellness plan and education. And I, I one of my ways of paying back this county, because they've been so good to me uh, over the years, is I do a lot of community education. I actually talked to the bus drivers the other day about wellness and vaccines, et cetera. Uh, I've talked to the uh, rehab groups about you know substance use disorders of brain injury uh, I've, I've done a lot of things because i think that's where it starts you know we i've done sex education for the uh sixth seventh and eighth graders here uh, so you have to talk to people before they get into the situation before they are already dependent before they're already there but you also have to have the other community supports because it's going to happen with some of them with no doubt next so what is treatment uh the level is determined by the severity of the problem and use, it's important to find out, is this person dependent or non-dependent? And there were, during the cocaine years, there were a lot of people that did cocaine on weekends, but they didn't do it every day. They were non-dependent. You know, is there a medical or a psychiatric co-occurring disorders? You've got to know that. Inpatient treatment is reserved for those with the most serious, we're going to talk about that in a minute, dependence and comorbidity. And it's patient-centered. That's the most important thing. Each person is different. Each person's chemistry is different. Each person's background, what they've been through in life is different. Uh, it was interesting to me, I, I was on a call the other day, we we're actually developing a uh, residential uh, uh, situation for women in our county. And we had a couple of doctors and a couple of social workers and a, um, uh, through uh, Ernie Fletcher's program, we, we had someone who was in recovery, who was helping us run the recovery program. Every one of us had a story. I mean, uh, you know, you say doctors, well, they don't have, you know, every one of us had a story and we got into that and it, it was kind of amazing to me, but Treatment may include counseling, therapy, and other psychological rehabilitation services. It may include MAT, um, so uh, co-occurring disorders, uh, and in conjunction with talk therapy. So one of my big prejudices is we've got a lot of clinics where they just hand out the uh, Suboxone, the buprenorphine, naltrexone, and uh, the patients say they don't really get any counseling. That is malpractice to me. You need to have the talk therapy along with the medication. You need to be working on that the self-help support groups, the health and wellness coaching, uh, work rehab, job training, and combinations, all of the above. I, I've talked to providers who did MAT, who looked down upon AA and didn't trust AA and thought it was useless because some of the AAs didn't want them in MAT. Uh, uh, I've, I've talked to uh, Reach for Recovery in our local areas. They actually allow them to utilize MAT while they're, while they're in there. Uh, some of the studies say 7%. Um, success rate with AA is some say 47%. You know, it depends on who is doing the study. And as the old saying is, figures lie and liars figure. 
um, you ha have to really look at the information, but there's some use of that. I don't care. I told the map providers, I don't care what you say if it's 7%, but I've had patients that got off their medications, went to these self-help groups and have been sober for 20 years. So they were. I've also had the AA people. I said, you know, this is a brain disorder. They need that mat. You know, we haven't worked out exactly what all we need to do and how we're going to do that. And I could argue that with, with mat providers and non-mat providers for a long time, what we need to be doing on that. Uh, but, um, you know, we need to work together. And health and wellness coaching, diet and exercise, meditation, we know endorphins go up with, with the correct exercise and with meditation. Endorphins are apomorphine-like substances that actually help with addiction. So that works. Uh, one of the most successful programs, uh, I was at a core meeting and, and we had one of the ARC um, rehab programs and they were doing mat and self-help groups. And when they added job training, their success rate went up from something like 60% to 90%. And uh, our consortium here in Lake Cumberland area um, community um, action agency, we talk about job rehab and we've got a very active job, job rehab. And as some of your talker, uh, speakers did at lunchtime when they talked about it, that job's so important. You've got to have something to go to. You've got to have something to do each day that you get up. Uh, for most of it, it's our job. I was a workaholic. I worked 60 to 110 hours a week uh, when I was in practice. And people don't believe that, but that's true. I've, I've left home on Thursday and not got home till Tuesday and been up almost the entire time. Uh, now that I'm retired, I don't have to do that, but I've still got three part-time jobs. But, but you've got to feel like you've got something to do. You've got to feel like you're worthwhile. Uh, that helps you. Next. So co-occurring mental health disorders, and everybody on here, I'm sure, is aware of this. About 50% of people with drug addiction, uh, substance use disorder, or mental illness, uh, and, and there's about a 50% cross-reactivity with that. Um, we know that uh, most of that is depression and anxiety, although some schizophrenia is unmasked by some of the drugs. Uh, the anxiety is really difficult for a provider because you got somebody who comes in and anxious. Are they going through withdrawal? Um, they're, they're doing their medications and they're not lasting as long and they're going through withdrawal. Is that part of the anxiety or is there something else that's causing the anxiety? And so if I prescribe an anxiolytic to them along with the opioid, I'm, I'm increasing the risk for overdose. And it is really, I've got a, another lecture. I give doctors, it's a teeter-totter. The doctor standing in between and the teeter-totter the other way. You've got to really judge that. And, and uh, I, I pretty much did not use a lot of benzodiazepines. I tried to wean my patients down and, um, uh, so um, I, I used a lot more of the SSRIs for the anxiety, but uh, we've got to deal with that. Next, I'm getting the one minute warning here, so I better get moving. What we're doing is not working. Uh, 60 to 80% of uh, drug abusing prisoners commit new crimes following release. 95% of prisoners return to abuse following release. So we've got to work on that. And we are working on that with, uh, we're, we're actually reaching out to people while they're still in jail here in Russell County and uh, making sure that when they're discharged, they got a ride home. We stopped them from discharging after midnight uh, and, and uh, we're working on that. So we treat this as a chronic illness and a public health approach. Next. So detox, basically alcohol and benzodiazepines. Uh, most of the others, marijuana, the stimulants, uh, even the opioids can usually be done at a lower level. Uh, if there is active withdrawal symptoms, GI, uh, diaphoresis, agitation, hallucinations, confusion, you may get them past the, the screeners and, and get them admitted and get them on in. But I've detoxed a lot of patients from the opioids as an outpatient. I just made a point to see them back the next day, three days, uh, every three days till they were fairly stable. And then every week, so you just need to bring them back a little earlier. But patients who experience severe psychological withdrawal symptoms may require the 24 hours. Next. Okay. Um,